are those posters. Okay, so it is 11 o'clock, so I think we'll get started. So we're entering the contributed talk part of our program, and the first one is from Brian Butler from NRAO, and he's going to talk to us about synergies between SK and NGVLA for observations of solar system bodies. Okay, I think I'm on. Um, thanks to Eric and Tyler and the SOC for giving me the opportunity to talk about these two fantastic telescopes. And for putting Catherine first and me second, it's clear that solar system objects and observations are the most important things that uh, SKA and NGVLA can do. But seriously, historically about between 5 and 10 percent of VLA time is spent on solar systems. So it is a pretty big chunk of time. Okay, I'm going to talk about some things in the solar system, but as Catherine said, you know, the, the topic is too broad to cover in 30 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour. So I'm not going to talk about the sun. Um, there's lots of interesting physics observations that can be done at the low frequencies, especially. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the giant planets. Catherine did a great job of doing that. I will talk some about the terrestrial planets. I won't talk as much about small bodies. They're more uh, sort of the, the purview of NGVLA, with the higher frequencies, because the emission tends to be thermal, so it's frequency squared. So you want to go to the higher frequencies. Um, why radio? Catherine did a great job of describing this. You see deep. And this is unique to radio wave, not quite unique. Um, X-rays are similar in some ways, gamma rays. Um, but uh, you see deep, so 10 wavelength, 10 to 100 wavelengths in solid body, uh, solid bodies, and 10, one to tens of bars in the giant planets. Why interferometry? You want the resolution. I think we all know this, um, but you also need large scales, uh, sensitivity to large scales. So you need resolution, but you need lots of short baselines as well. This is really important. If you look at the sizes of things in the solar system, they go from degrees plus. I mean, the, the tail of Hyakutake comet, Hyakutake, was 75 degrees across the sky. And so th there are huge structures. But then as you go, you know, sort of from large to smaller bodies, you get to Venus and Jupiter, about an arc minute, tens of arc seconds for uh, Mars and Saturn, Mercury, a few arc seconds, Uranus and Neptune. And then as you go further out, these things that Catherine was talking about, the trans-Neptunian objects, they're sort of 5 to 50 milli arc seconds. So you need lots of resolution. But again, you've got these big things, so you need uh, sensitivity to emission on large scales as well. Um, why do you need the wide frequency coverage, the emission uh, uh, reflection and, and absorption mechanisms that are happening? Thermal, reflected, solar, radar, other. Um, for instance, the emission from Saturn itself is reflected from its rings, and you can actually measure that, so that's kind of cool. Um, synchrotron, gyrocyclotron, Catherine talked about that quite a bit. I won't talk about it. Lightning, triboelectric, so this is dust storms, uh, friction from the dust inside dust storms, um, and occultation. So these occur across sort of all frequencies, and so you need a wide frequency range. That's the importance of having both SKA and NGVLA. Okay, um, solar system body, a, a very important thing is why we need both hemispheres. So. Uh, Solar system bodies are nearly unique in that a single body can go from, you know, minus 70 to plus 70 declination, and in some cases over a period of a day or two. And, you know, nearly all classes of astrophysics have bodies in both hemispheres, but solar system is unique in the sense that a single body can go through both of these hemispheres. So you need uh, observatories in both the north and south, NGVLA in the north, SKA low and mid in the south is fantastic. In fact, for these kinds of time variable phenomena, you'd like three of them um, in each hemisphere so that you can cover whatever phenomena is happening. This is why the DSN has uh, telescopes at three longitudes, but 
that's not going to happen. It's too expensive. Um, so some examples. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Uh, but if you look at giant planets, this is 10 years um, on the bottom. And declinations. So giant planets, they're moving around. Terrestrial planets with no moon, even more. Um, a lot of this is Earth motion, but also the planets themselves. If you add the moon, it just fills it because the moon is all over the place. Um, so that just fills it in. This is minus 30 to plus 30 dec. The nine largest main belt asteroids, the same deal. Um, minus 40 to plus 40. The 10 largest TNOs, um, same deal. They don't move around in declination, but if you want to cover them all, you need uh, north and south. Closest approach declination for the 40 closest near-Earth asteroids. This is over the last 30 years, I think I took this from. So all declinations. This is a little bit of a cheat because, again, um, some of them at least move very rapidly as a function uh, in declination as a function of time. So if you want to cover a single body as it comes through its closest approach, you need both north and south. Same thing for comets. Um, you know, they're minus 70 to plus 60-ish. So you need both hemispheres. It's very clear. Um, as Catherine said, and I mentioned earlier, the, the whole of solar system science is too broad to cover in one talk. Uh, there are uh, reviews of this. I wrote one with co-authors for the 2004 SKA book. Um, we w wrote one more recently for the NGVLA book. There are others like the 2017 French uh, white book, SKA white book. So look to the other references uh, literature to see the sort of full description of things. There are other chapters, as Catherine listed, in the NGVLA book, um, specific one on comets, one on uh, radar, several on solar. So look there. But I'm going to give a few examples, um, and I'm going to focus mostly on areas where both SKA and NGVLA can contribute. So I will talk a little bit about the terrestrial planets, um, Venus, surface and subsurface, and lightning. Uh, so Tony's last slide where he showed the lightning uh, on Earth, that's a, a good example. Um, any uh, planet with an atmosphere almost certainly has some lightning. The question is, what are its properties? What's its frequency, uh, its distribution across the globe, things like that. I'll talk about Mars, dust storms and radar, comets, uh, probing cometary Comey via OH and maybe CH, there's a question mark there. Uh, I will talk about one thing for the giant planets, that's Saturn deep water, a specific one. Catherine talked about that quite a bit, which was great. And I will t uh, give a single slide on exoplanet long wavelength emission. Uh, again, Catherine already talked about that. OK, Venus subsurface. Because of the thick atmosphere, it's only at longer wavelengths that you see through the atmosphere to the surface. Um, there are still very important questions about the surface and subsurface that are unanswered, especially there's a question about the long wavelength emission. And high resolution, so understanding the distribution of this across the disk will be very important. So this is a, from an old paper of mine. So VLA, you, you, those of us who observed with the VLA before the upgrade will, will understand why these particular frequencies, they were the default continuum frequencies at C-band, X-band, KU-band, K-band. So K-band, KU-band, you barely start to see the tops of the mountains. The one-way opacity at X-band is about one, and at C-band, you start to see the whole thing. And this is the emission spectrum, whole disk emission. The model says it should sort of be constant at long wavelengths. The observations, it drops off by hundreds of kelvins, which is very strange. And th there are papers about this uh, in the literature. In, uh, so lightning, specifically. As in Earth's atmosphere, as I said, there is almost certainly lightning in Venus's atmosphere. This was detected back with the Venera, we think, with the Venera probes, the Russian Venera probes. It's been quite controversial in the last 10 years or so because of VEX observations, which have been inferred to mean that there's lots of lightning that's happening on Venus. Um, there's a good review by Ralph Lorenz in 2018 about the whole controversy and the, the causes of this and the, the possible um, mechanisms for lightning on Venus. I'll show a figure from it in a minute. Lightning it tends to be stronger at lower frequencies. It has a, it's, it's like a synchrotron-ish spectrum. Um, so you want to go to low frequencies. It's fast, 
sort of a one to 100 milliseconds, so you need to high time sampling. We've tried this on the VLA, um, but never detected it. So high time resolution observations, especially with SKA low, will be very important for this. It doesn't have great resolution, so you won't be able to resolve, I mean, in terms of the size of Venus. So you won't be able to resolve it, but um, you'll be able to at least detect it, presumably. And other planets, uh, Jupiter certainly has detected lightning, Saturn does as well. Um, so being able to monitor these things from Earth is a very important thing. Uh, so this is a figure from, from Ralph's uh, review paper. So you've got uh, cloud, cloud to cloud lightning potentially, you've got volcanic maybe outgassing, we don't know if there's current volcanic out outgassing, but there might be. Um, cloud to ground, and then maybe this dust uh, wind generated tribal electric uh, activity. Okay, Mars dust storms. Um, Mars dust storms are common. They occur on all scales. Um, sort of global, you've, you've heard about Martian global dust storms to regional. They are dependent on season. Uh, as the, the polar caps wax and wane, you get these uh, dust storms that are sort of generated from the edges of the seasonal cap. Um, dust storms on Earth give rise to this, what's called tribal electric, which is the dust grains rubbing against each other. Uh, it tends to be low frequent, it's like lightning in the sense that it's low frequency emission. Um, it, it's a well studied uh, phenomenon in Earth dust storms. Um, the atmosphere is thinner, the dust is finer on Mars, but almost certainly this is happening on Mars. We've tried to observe it at the VLA, actually it's been tried at other observatories as well, um, but sensitivity and resolution are just not enough to, to really detect this. Uh, so this will be an important area. Um, I'm gonna show a slide, this is from recent, well relatively recent, 2018 data. There was a dust storm, uh, this is a grad student at UCLA, Maxwell Parks is working on this data. There was a dust storm, we had a, a target of opportunity proposal, um, a dust storm was detected, we observed, uh, we should have seen, uh, it's hard to tell, but in the sort of upper right limb, we should have, if there was any emission detectable, we should have seen it, but we don't. But it's, again, it's, it's a sensitivity problem. Um, Mars radar, we, radar for Mars has been done since the 1960s. Um, lots of important discoveries. With the Goldstone NGVLA uh, radar, you can do amazing things. Um, again, look in the literature. With a, a reasonably powered uh, transmitter in the south, you could do similar things with SKA, uh, with SKA mid probably. Um, there are existing transmitters, but they're relatively low power. They're sort of 100-ish watts. Uh, yep. Um, it's not restricted to Mars and see Marina's chapter in the NGVLA book for other examples. So this is um, Goldstone to VLA uh, data taken around 1990. This is for my thesis, in fact, remarkably enough. And you can make movies, you know, Mars rotates about the same rotation rate as the Earth. So you can make a movie. Um, this is nothing like the resolution that Tony showed in those images of the moon, which is spectacular. Um, but it's very nice. Uh, you can see South Polar residual cap the Tharsis volcanoes, this thing we called stealth, the Elysium volcano complex, all sorts of interesting stuff. Okay, cometary OH and CH. Um, measuring cometary OH is one of the primary ways of deriving water production for comets, which is an important uh, property to understand OH. And then if you know the, the sort of ratio of OH to water, which you know from the dissociation, that's the main way you get OH, is you have water comes off the surface, um, and it's broken down into OH plus H. Uh, the OH coma is huge. So this has typically been done with single dishes. But if you look at individual background sources as they're occulted in the, this coma, the atmosphere of a comet, you can actually probe the structure of OH. I mentioned CH because it's similarly excited. The thing about OH is it's a maser um, and it's excited depending on the relative velocity with the sun. And so it can get, have very high absorption or uh, emission enhancement factors. CH is a similar molecule, is similarly excited, um, but it has a sort of uh, 
checkered history in terms of whether it's been detected on comets or not. Um, this is, we did this for Comet Hale-Bopp, uh, Pat Palmer and I, for different objects on different days, um, absorption or emission depending on its velocity relative to the sun. This is an amazing movie um, made by Ben Hugo uh, with Meerkat. Um, the, moon, the, the topic is completely different, but the size is roughly about what you expect a cometary coma to be. And what I want you to, to pay attention to as I play this movie is the background sources are moving, and you'll see like this one moves right through it. Uh, with more sensitivity, you have lots of background sources, and so you can probe uh, through the, the OH coma and essentially map the coma, the, the uh, uh, density. It's a measurement of the density as a function of position in the coma. Another nice thing about this is, you know, you might say Meerkat, well, it's, it's only 13 and a half meter antennas and it's not very many of them and eight kilometer baselines. This is a fantastic image. Um, it's a, an amazing snapshot machine for large structures. It's better than the VLA, far better than the VLA. Um, Rick Perley, uh, Oleg Smirnov, Ben, and others I'm involved in this have been using, th the main point of this is actually to get polarization uh, calibration properties for the telescope. Okay, Saturn deep H2, you can measure the deep water abundance. Uh, if you can go to long wavelengths, this is an example VLA P-band. Um, recently done by Mark Hofstadter and I. Exoplanet long wavelength emission, um, as Catherine said, you expect it to happen. Uh, in answer to Peter's question, there are models for, I think it was Peter, there are models for this, there are scaling models essentially. So you put in the magnetic field, the rotation rate, things like that. You scale it to what Jupiter does, and that's how we think you should be able to see this, but there's, there are no undisputed detections of this. Okay. I will put this up uh, as a summary and take questions, since I'm at time almost. Okay, thanks a lot. So we do have a question online, which is, would the lightning on Venus be detectable to LOFAR? Maybe. Um, Maybe, and it's a good point because they have pretty good sensitivity and high time resolution. So uh, low far, you could probably do it now. I don't know if it's been tried. I'm not sure. Other questions? Let's see. Uh, so we have a few over here, one in the back there. Oh, from Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, no pressure. Um, Real quick, the detection of water on Saturn, is it a direct detection or is it indirect through like CO? It, it's indirect in the sense that all continuum deep observations are indirect. Same, same as... Okay, so continuum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not a spectral line. No, it's P-band. It's 240 to 480 megahertz, so... Uh, Peter? I just wanted to note that the the low frequency SK1 low, uh, both of these telescopes are supposed to or will be equipped with transient buffers. So for this lightning situation, it might be quite interesting to have those. I don't really know if, whether you can comment on whether they are that sort of thing would be needed or whether that is something you don't need. For oh, this, absolutely, for that. yeah. And the same is in the plan for the NGVLA. And, and not only for Venus lightning, but things like FRBs and well, of um, course, yeah. I was just thinking of that specific lightning case. Yeah, for that specific case. Again, the, the time scales are not quite as short as some other, other phenomena, but they're of order 10 milliseconds. So you need, you need to buffer up, you know, an hour's worth of observations, look at it, and then you might just throw it all on the floor, except for some averaged version of it, if you don't see any transient signal. Yeah, I don't remember the details, but I mean, it might be something that could do that sort of thing. Yeah. Tom, over here. So what is the expected spectral shape for the lightning? So it gets, uh, uh, it's not quite synchrotron. It's actually a little stronger than synchrotron, if memory serves. It gets stronger with lower frequency, essentially. Okay. So it's, it's like new to the minus one. Okay. So, so given that, is it possible that LOFAR is even a little bit more sensitive it, than SKA because it can go to much lower frequency? Well, yeah, I mean, much lower, you know, it's 50 versus 
30 megahertz or something. Um, and the Earth's, Earth's atmosphere cuts off everything. You'd like to go to even lower, and, and for the exoplanet emissions, you'd like to go below 10 megahertz, which you know Joe has a, is involved in putting a, uh, an instrument on the back, far side of the moon um, so that you, you aren't blocked in that lower 10 megahertz or whatever, because it just continues to get stronger and stronger, at least if Jupiter is any guide for the exoplanet emission. Okay, thanks. Adam, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so excuse me for being, hello? Okay. Excuse me for being very uh, noob in this field, but uh, with pulsars and FRB, these transients, you can use dispersion measures to tell between RFI and, and an actual signal. How do you tell the difference between light, lightning and RFI? Lightning and RFI. RFI, RFI yeah. Um, so can be difficult. RFI tends to have a different spectrum. So you'd like to, to measure it across some, some frequency range and be able to see the expected spectrum that you want to see. Whereas RFI tends to be very sort of frequency specific. Uh, um, so unique frequencies. Uh, but yes, RFI has some of the same signatures, can have some of the same, as you say, from the dispersion, uh, some of the same characteristics as lightning. Okay, we're going to have to stop it there. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Brenda.